You know how in every single setting, there's a character that everyone loves to hate? Well, this isn't that guy. This guy is widely hated by the community despite being given some of the coolest art. Mortarian, leader of 14th Legion, Death Guard, is an enigma wrapped in a riddle taped to a Rubik's Cube. Someone who, at surface value, is just a brooding, smelly moth, but under a microscope, they're even smellier. There's a special place in my heart for characters that I love to hate, and then there's characters that I normally just hate. The best example I can find on my feelings of Mortarian is how I feel about Ava from Borderlands 3. They both barely develop as people or narrative devices. They just mope around, and every time they're around people, they're avoided like the plague. Ava has the excuse of being a teenage psychic wizard with an attitude and wings, and all Mortarian has is being a psychic teenage wizard with wings and an attitude. But he also smells like shit. Well dang, now I can't even figure out why I like Mortarian. But if I had to guess, it probably has something to do with how he was essentially spawn camped. Angron did have a significantly worse situation, but he's the only one who has more of an excuse than Morty. Maybe you could say the lion since he just landed in a forest haunted by demons, but Morty landed on a world where people just die from breathing. The vast majority of the population of Barbarus was living in pockets of clean air since the entire planet was coated in a thick layer of smog. Not only did they have to deal with the ever-present miasma, but these humanoid necromancer things named the Overlords would regularly raid these villages forcing the humans into a constant state of fear and migration. These overlords would construct golems of flesh, soil, and muck to act as infantry to destroy homes and carry off the population for whatever sick experiments the overlords desired. Granted his demigod body was able to handle the toxic air, it wasn't like Mortarian was having a good time. He was in constant pain from the second his little pod cracked open, and his adopted father would use this weakness against him. At first, his adopted father raised the boy to be his own, since Daddy Overlord's balls held pee instead of the baby juice that we normal humans do. We aren't entirely sure if they're a different species entirely, or just an abomination that's sterile. The Overlord that adopted him was named Nicare, and he would give Mortarian his first hope that one day, he might have a father that loved him, or in some way or another, would be proud of him. Day in and out, Mortarian would delve deeper into the archives of Nacaire, consuming knowledge on a level that made Nacaire uneasy. You don't become the high overlord of a world without being a pretty smart individual, and despite Mortarian's attempt to hide his veracity for knowledge, Nacaire would come to see his adopted son as no more as one of his ilk, but as a rival, and this disgusted him. At first, it was slow, but soon enough, all the affection that was shown to little baby Mortarian was just gone. And little abused Morty one day, when he was brooding in his tower, saw something strange. He saw shapes in the distance. Shapes not like the overlords, but like himself. Leaping from his window, it's unknown if this was the moment Mortarian was damned, or if this was just fate. But Mortarian met the future herald of Nurgle, Typhon, who at this point, was going by Callus Typhus. Saving the boy from the golems and returning him home to his village, upon seeing other people like himself, albeit a lot shorter and a lot less mesomorphic, he swore to himself and them that he would do all that he could to free Barbarus from the oppression of the overlords. It's from this humble shantytown that Mortarian first wielded a scythe, first assumed the visage of the Grim Reaper. Mortarian worked harder than any mortal ever could for his people, farming and foraging far in excess of the tattered cloths and gaunt figures common throughout this village. Soon, Mortarian had himself an army, and in a series of crusades across Barbarus that are all too similar to the Emperor's reunification of Terra, Mortarian slowly acquired better arms and armor over time, allowing his human companions to tolerate the miasma that was Barbarus's atmosphere. At first, they marched forward in ramshackle flak armors, suffering heavy losses, but eventually, powered armor. Not on the level of the early Crusades Astartes armor, but a powered exoskeleton capable of fending off the miasma was enough to conquer all but the last bastion on Barbarus. And this is where the second breaking of Mortarian starts. Unlike the smelly necromancer with no working balls that adopted the baby Mortarian, this big gold armored man actually was his father but that wasn't revealed to him yet. The stranger, as Big E decided to go by this time, gave gifts to the people and spoke of liberation. At the dawn of victory, 
this stranger had come to take victory away from the Pale King. Mortarion rejected the stranger's help, claiming Barbarus did not need his help, and that he did not need his help. But the stranger proposed a deal. Mortarion would be given the chance to achieve his ultimate victory, given the chance to enact his revenge on the creature that was Nacaire, yet if he was to fail, Mortarion would swear himself to the stranger and join him in this Imperium of Man. Whether by psychic manipulation or the actual sheer toxicity of the atmosphere of Barbarus, Mortarion collapsed just moments away from achieving his ultimate victory. After a grueling trial that destroyed his armor and burned his flesh, he was to fail. And not just fail, but to watch what was to be his prize come to claim him as though he was the prize all along. Right before Nacaire could kill the young Primarch, the stranger appeared and struck down the overlord with the flaming sword, and Mortarion was once again consumed by darkness. When he awoke, he found the stranger beside him. Despite being bitter and not feeling an ounce of love for this emperor, Mortarion held his end of the bargain. And after being granted the 14th Legion, who were up to then known as the Dusk Raiders, he changed their name to his Death Guard. And with them at his side, Mortarion set out amongst the stars. And unlike his Primarch brothers who tried diplomacy and sometimes religion, all Mortarion would bring with him to the stars was the visage of the Reaper. Death and destruction would be all that followed the 14th Legion, as the tactics honed on the fields of Barbarus were brought along with the young Primarch. The human wave tactics he employed on Barbarus with primitive armors and exoskeletons was now being led by cataphracty terminator squads. Favoring the maneuverability of terminators as opposed to the standard Astartes vehicles, the Death Guard still suffered terrible losses. However, the ever embittered Reaper of the 14th did not let his scythe dry, for he swore as long as he drew breath, blood would be spilled in his name. He was censored for this, not to the level of Magnus or the 2nd and 11th, but bad enough that Horus and Sanguinius had to come to give him a talking to. Not seeing the wisdom brought to him by the Lunar Wolf and the Angel, the frustrated duo would depart from their twisted brother with nothing but sorrow in their hearts. Then came the Council of Nikea. Mortarion and Lehman Russ were adamantly against Psykers, after seeing the abuse of psychic powers on their homeworlds and out amongst the stars. This is probably the only time Mortarion felt even a hint of affection from his brothers or his father, and the only time he would be viewed as anything more than a destroyer. The final betrayal before his turning to chaos, however, was soon to follow, as his closest friend from Barbarus, Callus Typhus, would turn. Typhus would set a course for deep void space, where the Death Guard would rapidly corrupt into warp spawns. Cancerous growths and tentacles sprung forth from the bodies of the Astartes, and Typhus would use his Psyker powers to spin an illusion for his gene father. He told his father that the problem was the navigators. Pulling at the heartstrings Mortarion laid bare at the Council of Nikea, it was only after that the Primarch realized his error. Typhus, now Typhon, Herald of Nurgle revealed himself to Mortarion, and after the demon body of Typhon was maimed and mutilated countless times, a defeated Mortarion understood that he had no choice, and when, for the first time in his life, a loving father spoke to him, he was all too happy to listen. The grandfather Nurgle had come to bless the Reaper of Barbarus and ascend him to demonhood. Giving his flesh and bones to the grandfather, Mortarion began to contort and morph just like his sons. And soon enough, the smelly Mothman of the 14th was born. Now that we have the backstory out of the way, we can start with an objective viewpoint, followed by my subjective viewpoint. Now, if you compare the upbringing of Mortarion, there are not many other Primarchs that were dealt such a poor hand. Conrad Kurz and Angron come to mind, but Angron has the Butcher's Nails, and Conrad was... Conrad. Granted, Mortarion didn't have a very good upbringing, he also never actually succeeded in anything. He wanted to learn all that Nacaire had to offer and grow under him, but that was ripped away from him due to the Overlord's jealousy. Then, he gets 99% of the way through liberating Barbarus, and Daddy Emperor shows up to claim all of the glory. No matter how hard Mortarion tried, he could never win. And now, for subjective. Mortarion is an ultimate tragedy. I personally believe that Mortarion and Magnus both held the same spot in the Emperor's grand plan. I also think that the Emperor let Mortarion go, since Big E still believed he had Magnus. Despite the sheer capacity of Magnus, there was no temperance. If Mortarion was to be the premier psyker among the Primarchs, 
he would have the wisdom to wield the power correctly. If Mortarion had been given just a single hug from his dad, or Big E had just used 1% of his psychic powers to shield Mortarion from the Miasma and Barbarus, then we could see a changed Mortarion. We would get to see him realize his dream of liberating Barbarus, and then maybe circumstances would be different. Unlike Ava from Borderlands 3, and yes, I'm bringing her back up because I hate her so fucking much, Mortarion isn't even given a single victory. Ava, on the other hand, has no excuse for not developing as a character since she goes through essentially a hero's journey. Mortarion, on the other hand, is just handed defeat after be defeat, betrayal after betrayal. Mortarion is one of the most tragic characters in 40k, especially since he is just a victim of the setting. And by that, I mean that he's been written into a spot where he has no development despite being a super intelligent space wizard. There is almost no nuance to the Death Guard as a whole, and especially Mortarian. But what can we expect? All of the love that Game Workshop had for Mortarian went towards designing his model for the tabletop. Having literal Mothman in the setting is just so cool, and I'm thankful that he was given this tiny grace from Daddy GW.